Which reminds me, folks, on our merch store, you can buy Bigfoot concrete things to put in your garden. I'm just kidding. That's right. <laughs> it's actually modeled after dumps in my feet. We just walk through plaster and send it out. State of Survival Podcast, bringing you survival game news. Today, Yarl is going to be leading the episode once again. And I think this episode is going to be quite fun. Yarl, what's in store for us? Well, I have been researching an upcoming tonight title that I'm super excited for. But you know what? Before we do that, let's go ahead and find out what our team is up to. Uh, I, for one, am looking forward to a normal stream schedule, which has been very hard to achieve the last three weeks. So we've got Dungeons and Dragons tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, after that, we've got a Daisy stream with the podcast gang here. On Friday, we're going to be playing modded Fallout 4, where I have a 942 mods installed. Saturday, we're going to be playing Fallout Aurora. And then after that, we should be playing more Space Engineers. So I'm looking forward to a really good week. <laughs> so Red Falcon here. Um, I've been, let's see, I released a, uh, a new heli about a week ago, the uh, UH-1H. Um, and uh, so that's been pretty popular. So doing a little bit of tweaking on that, and I just finished a build out on a Sikorsky S76 with a fully functional cockpit. All the gauges work. Um, so that's pretty nice. fun. And then playing as part of my quote unquote research for a video I'm doing about uh, five survival games that we recommend and playing a fair bit of Rust. Uh, Going to be shifting to um, oh, what am I doing next? Um, probably either Sons of the Forest, which I know we're going to uh, talk about a little bit, or um, well, we'll see. That's That's been okay. my, my life. Sweet, sweet. Now, you do know we're going to be playing DayZ Thursday, Red, and I just want to make sure you're not going to be too rusty. Oh, that's so bad. Actually, I will, because the <laughs> action button in Rust is E, and the action button in DayZ is F, as we all it's know. F. So. Yep. Yeah, so I, I always get a, I'm, I'm hitting E going, nothing's happening. Why can't I open this door? Mm -hmm. oh, oh, stupid rust. <laughs> oh, that, that, that really sucks. Uh, folks, can, can, we, can we get a couple of Fs in chat for poor Red Falcon here? <laughs> Wait, F or E? <laughs> uh, uh, or, you know what, just let's do both. One of them will work. <laughs> and how oh about you, Dump Crawl? What's been going on in your neck of the woods? Well, in my neck of the woods, I finally finished my almost, I think, three and a half month to four month long TMS treatment. I am finally happy that is over. That's like 32 miles a day. I'm no longer having to drive. So, whoo! Thank gosh for that. Man, that was definitely a, definitely a hurdle. Uh, but I'm also started playing Elden Ring on my Twitch channel. And folks, it was a lot of fun actually playing on PC. I tried to play Elden Ring previously, but you know what? As much as PlayStation Remote Connect or your own home network is cool, the latency between my input and the PlayStation literally right next to my desk just didn't work. Or well, actually, it's on my other side of the wall. I literally could like smash my head at my uh, PlayStation, but um, it was just too much. So now I have it on PC and it is amazingly easier to play. And I got the war pick, so that's really cool. Can't wait to do a full playthrough with just the one pick. But in other news, speaking about DayZ and playing it on Thursday, I have officially lightly monetized my YouTube channel. What the hell does that mean, folks? It means that now I can have Super Chat, YouTube memberships, and so many other little cool things of my own self-revenue. Doesn't mean I make money from ads from the YouTube ads that play on my live streams, if they do, but it does mean now if you people wish to, they can become part of my members. But we'll talk more about that Thursday if you guys drop by. But other than that, yeah. that's kind of it for me. All right. Well, listen, there are a lot of survival games coming out in 2023 and 2024. And we got to see some amazing footage in some of the expos that they had, like the PlayStation, uh, Games Live, Xbox, PC. And a lot of them are really amazing because they seem to be breaking that trend of being zombie survival or horror survival there's a lot more exploration going on with fantasy as well as realism so i'm looking forward to it 
One of the ones that caught my eye uh, and my attention, which is the topic for today, is Pacific Drive. Um, but some survival games early released in 2023 have also seen some attention. Don't forget that Sons of the Forest released back in February. And although there were some key components missing during our live stream, we decided to go ahead and play some Sons of the Forest and see what was updated, what was fixed, and if the game ran better. And honestly, we were pleasantly surprised. So, right. while we played with Dump and Dimension 119, we uh, sat on an island surrounded by cannibals and mutants, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, All right, well, let's let's go ahead and cut over and talk about our highlights with the live stream. What do you think, Dump? Oh, yeah, I think we should definitely do that. So one of the things that I struggled with when the game first launched was that you had to have a host on your friends list that played the game uh, that you could join. And the problem was it can have up to, I think, 16 players. We really didn't push the envelope that far, but man, it was duty for performance. And I was kind of alarmed at how much of a drag it was in the very beginning. Uh, usually it only happened when you were falling off a cliff and traveling a very far rate of speed, but it was still so amazing to see how well the game actually happened to run. Um, what did you think about, you know, the stability performance updates on your end? Did you notice a difference too much? Uh, are you talking about when we first started playing or this last uh, time? Compared to when we compared to when we first started and then when we played after they had released those updates. It was definitely a lot smoother, a lot less, uh, I would say, input registration lag. So like if I swung an ax, my client would say I hit it, but the thing wouldn't react at all. And it seems a lot better this time where it didn't happen pretty much ever. I think it was pretty much always instantaneous. So I think that's actually pretty nice that it was able to do that with, uh, yeah, it was three of us playing, if I remember correct. And that was a lot of fun. Yeah, there were three of us. We normally played with four before, so I wasn't expecting a huge impact. But like you were talking about, the input lag and the stutters, that was what was really getting me. Uh, if you were working and you felled a tree and it knocked other trees down, there was that momentary stutter. It also didn't help when you were being attacked by a small army of mutants having that stutter because there were a lot of times it like you said you'd click to swing that axe but then the big guy would just backhand you and you'd go uncon because it wasn't registering the hit but it was almost non-existent which is huge in my opinion yeah it, it was nice uh i definitely uh agree and uh yeah further to my point uh i remember in the early days when we were first playing it it's still the early days by the way <laughs> Um, but they would walk over our flycatcher traps and bone breaker traps, and we would visually see them go off and they would just keep walking to us. Now it looks like, uh, it's actually more server side, them actually getting hurt by the traps and less client input side, which seems really nice because I think that definitely helped us, uh, survive one or two encounters. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there were even times when Puppy and I, we would know, oh, if you cut across the fly swatter trap here, you won't get hit by it. Uh, and then when I tried doing something similar with the traps we set up and ended up getting impaled pretty good. Uh, but, you know, there, there's one thing that they still have a problem with. You got to hotkey everything. There's still an issue where when you're trying to swap with certain weapons and items, we noticed it right off the bat when we started in the mountains when Dimension pulled out the bow he made and then the axe... And it got to a point to where when he was trying to fire the bow, he was swinging the axe with the bow in his hand. That still is prevalent, but we found through our plane that if you hotkey everything, you can avoid that bug entirely. I'm just chuckling because I remember seeing it. And folks, you literally see him pull out the bow, put it in his hands. Instead of pulling out an arrow, you see him literally knock his entire survival axe like he's about to... Yeah, we talked about how funny it would be to shoot tools at people. <laughs> uh, I, I did have a commenter on my chat say that the reason why that happened is because he didn't make any arrows. So it confused the system. But even so, that's a very weak excuse. You know, I can't even imagine another survival game where if you happen to be out of bullets and try to pull the trigger, all of a sudden your knife is pulled out and you're sitting there on your gun. <laughs> that would be very wonky, but uh, it was still a very pleasurable experience. 
I, I want to say this, and I'm going to say this with all the love to Daisy, but that sounds like a very Daisy bug to have happen. I didn't say it, <laughs> but I felt it. <laughs> <laughs> hey but, guys, I found an SKS. Is there any ammo in it? Click. Dude, did you just shoot a teddy bear? No. Uh, moreover, one of the things that I would like to talk about with Sons of the Forest is the features that they've added. When the game first came out and we were actually playing with uh, Puppy Blue, you and I, we would go to the water and you could drink from the lake and you wouldn't have to worry about getting poisoned because there were no water catchers. So there was no point in making the water poison. Well, now it's poison just like it was in the forest, which was kind of a shock and surprise when we were in the mountains trying to get water. And it was like, why is it hurting me? Uh, I also noticed the cold weather and being too hot also damages your health and your energy, which was such a nice change. It's such a good update because it really makes it feel more survival than it did before because uh, we crashed in the mountains. We also yeah. got to play with hang gliders. Well, you and Dimension did because I couldn't figure it out at all. I I, I don't know what Dump saw. What I saw was I jumped off the mountain and just went, Yelp! and then nose dived into the rocks. Okay, I'll be fair. I want to say there's an elaborate story about how Yara epically failed. Folks, all I did is see him jump off a cliff in the dark, and then I hear him complaining. He hit the ground immediately. So there's not much of a story there. But me and Dimension got it pretty quickly. I mentioned being the new player who'd never really played it because his PC kept crashing because it was actually mm -hmm. a laptop. <laughs> um, Yarl, Yarl's a pro player, I swear. Just like he's a pro streamer. No, no, not at all. <laughs> actually, it's so funny, too, because I got the hang glider and there was that moment of like, oh, crap, is it inverted controls or is it not? I'm going to assume not. It was, which is good. If you have flight controls, they should always be inverted. Uh, but also water collectors are in the game. So uh, when I ended up getting turtle kidnapped shell. by the cannibals and escaped and got all those turtle shells, that we were able to build water collectors, and it was great. Yeah. Um, so now we have that. Now there's a reason to have the canteen, because you can't just go to every water source and drink from it. So now we're desperately going to be looking for that. But... More than that, what I'm super excited about, it was a shot in the dark because we were all starving to death. Dump goes, I'm going to try to build the fish traps and see if they work now. Because before, when you built the fish traps, you could build them, but they didn't catch any fish. And poor Dimension and I are on the beach hunting seagulls. So that's how desperate we were. <laughs> and Dump goes, oh, the traps are catching fish. It was an amazing revelation, and it definitely changes the game because it is hard to get food now. Yeah, I mean it, that is it's very very welcome change because fish is actually pretty damn good wise. Um, it's really cool. I love the animations of eating fish, especially when they're alive. They're all wiggling. And you're like, my precious. So <laughs> even when you even when you cook them, they're still wiggling. It's so weird. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, it, it's really cool. I would have to say, I hope they make it so water, um, drinking dirty water is a loss over time of the health instead of it being instantaneous. Right. So it'd be cool if your guy drank it and was all like, ugh. And then, like, you saw the uh, part of the health bar fade away. Because, like, when you take uh, medicine and stuff, there's a faded health bar area that shows what health you're going to regenerate. It would be cool if when you did something bad for your health, it would show a, a part of the health bar faded, like it, it's going to go away eventually. Uh, because I find instantly losing health because I drank dirty water to be okay, but I think it could be better if it was slowly loss of health. I couldn't agree amount. more. When we were when we were on the shore drinking water, all three of us, because we were desperate, hearing the oh, uh, uh, oh, uh, oh of all of our characters groaning, it was getting so oh, annoying. Down. And I couldn't figure it out because in the first game, if you drank the bad water, if you ate raw food, or if you ate human meat, there was a chance that your character would go and throw up on the ground, and then you would lose water and hunger. Bring that back. That worked so well. It really did. Uh, but my favorite thing was watching Dump, who, by the way, perfect character for you. It looked so much like your DayZ character, the Mr. Feeny. This old guy with an Einstein-style comb back and a thick mustache. But 
he figured out right away that you can build with rocks now. And that's huge. Oh, I'm so excited. I was rocking it. Well, you know what? This hot weather has me sweaty. And in speaking of hot weather, let's take a look at our hot takes. All right, everyone. My hot take is kind of touch and base on any game, really, but survival games as well. We always get this argument in the creative space as Assassin's Creed, Red Dead Redemption, and some of these other games are starting to encroach on 200 hours of playtime. And it had me thinking, what's more important, replayability, longevity, or is it a hybrid of the two? Now, in my opinion, if you're going to tackle a survival game, replayability has to be your primary focus. It's got to be intriguing and entertaining enough that it keeps you coming back, especially if it's a game where when you die, you start over with nothing. So it's got to have something that ropes you in. But at the same time with survival games, there should be some length to it. You don't want to play a survival game where it takes you so quick to get through the tech tree. In fact, Dumpgra has been playing, uh, he was playing Minecraft with Scott Dog uh, on his streams, and they had a mod that severely put in depth the tech tree and really took the replayability that Minecraft already has and added some longevity and life to it, which I thought was such a good idea. So whenever you're wondering if a game is not long enough so it's not worth the money, I wouldn't look at it in that respect because if it has a lot of replayability, you'd be surprised at how many hours you could get out of it. Uh, combining the two, in my opinion, is the perfect recipe for a survival game. And that's that's my hot take for this week. Very nice. Very nice. Well, you know, my hot take uh, kind of plays a little bit off of Jarl's just a ever so tad. My hot take is about third-party support for these kind of games. People who contribute to them, whether it be, you know, being the community, making tutorials, secret guides, or even discovering new ways to enjoy the game, even if the game can't be played with mods or other sort of forms of situation. In reality, a game is only as good as the people who actually enjoy the game itself. And that goes past even just you as a player. It goes to the community that surrounds the game and whether they have a reddit a twitter page a discord you name it it could be back on a uh, good old myspace for all i know but communities help enrich games and keep them playing longer which is why the other aspects of these games matter that's why in you know sons of the forest or daisy or whatever having server owners and even just having that base level of being able to run a community server can enhance and actually make a game thrive way, way longer. This is where it plays into Jarl's uh, hot take a bit, bit. Talking about the longevity of a game. Because if you build your game to have multiple ways of playstyles, multiple repeatable plays, even harder difficulty settings, you can take your survival game and make it last not thousands of um, a thousand hours, but tens of thousands of hours. I myself have well over 16,000 hours in Daisy alone, and that's not including my modding tools, folks. I love DayZ, and I love other survival games. I easily have probably about 4,000 hours in Minecraft alone, too. So think about that when you're looking at survival games. Does the survival game actually look like it has a community that is starting to grow and support it? And are there more ways for me to enjoy this game? And how can I support the people who keep making this game going if it does? I absolutely agree with everything you said, even if it's something like Fallout New Vegas, where once you beat it, you can activate Wild Wasteland and have a crazy experience with it. Something that you see with survival games is, like you said, it's a problem solving game and there's multiple ways to approach the problem. And there is no one right way to play the game. And that is replayability and it's purest, which gets me excited into this game that we're going to be talking about today, Pacific Drive, because Honestly, there's still a whole lot that we don't know about it. And I spent a lot of time digging in the forums to find out if I could get official responses from the team, find out more about it. So let's take it away. So Pacific Drive is a very interesting game developed by publishers Ironwood Studios, who are based out here in Seattle. 
And it talks about a tradition that we have in the Pacific Northwest that even led to some of the West Coast rallies that we have called the Pacific Drive. And typically you start in either California or you start in Northern Washington, you go through the Olympic Peninsula and down the coast, down towards uh, California. The endpoints are different each, you know, depending on who takes it, but it is kind of a tradition here for people who like to go on the road. And the developer of the game loved his station wagon so much, he wanted to tell a story about that, create a survival game with it, and of course, add the little bit of cryptid history that Washington State has with Bigfoots and aliens into the game. Uh, this is a run-based survival adventure. So basically, you're going to be traveling in the Olympic exclusion zone. Several years ago, something weird happened here from the abductors. Not a whole lot of information on who they are yet, but it's kind of signaling aliens. Kind of. The entire Olympic Peninsula has been raided off limits from the government, but adventurous people still want to take their Pacific Drive, because that's part of the culture too, driving where you're not supposed to, and also gather technology for wealth and riches that have been left behind in that zone. So you take your car, you drive out there, you have to avoid all the storms while you're out there and gather up parts to either upgrade your car or hopefully make some money in the future. The interesting thing, too, is you do have a base of operations in an abandoned garage. On the outside of the garage, you can see signs that say, feel free to take whatever you want, never coming back. So there's a lot of that life of people who just dropped everything and evacuated. But here you are in your circumstances. You are stuck here and you got to figure out your way out of the Olympic exclusion zone. But you can't just drive out. You have to go gather supplies, much like a roguelike run type simulator. Anytime you play a game like this, the general premise will be you can't just leave until you get to a certain point. That certain point is totally up to you. You can attempt to leave at any time, but it's more the exploration of the world, the building and crafting to try to get out of the zone. As you gather precious resources and investigate what's been left behind in the ruins, you are encountered with a hostile environment, hostile enemies, as well as the potential of upgrading your vehicle to make it last better. The game was announced in September of last fall, but uh, it's scheduled to release on PlayStation 5. That's the only console that's getting it and on PC for Steam and Epic Games. So it's definitely something to look forward to if you're either a PlayStation player or a PC player. Now, the question we have for the community is, what are your thoughts? Does this game seem like it will fit well with other solo survival games like Escape the Pacific or The Long Dark? And what do you look for in your solo survival experience? In the meantime, we'll go ahead and cover more of the game and see if that helps answer some of the questions you might have. So the setting is here in the Pacific Northwest dump, which is kind of interesting because there are games that are made here in the Pacific Northwest, such as Last of Us 2, but it always seems like they kind of miss the mark on what it's actually like to live out here, whether it's just the, the way that the nature looks or anything. When you think of a game that takes place in Pacific Northwest, what are some key components you're looking for? Um, I'm looking for a lot of, I would say, kind of forester, hiking trail kind of modernization. And what I mean by that is that there, when you go through the woods almost anywhere in the Pacific Northwest, there are parking, uh, there are hiking trails, there are tons of stuff because the people of the Northwest are constantly tread, treading new hiking trails. And folks, if you don't really know what I mean, is you can tell once somebody has done a hiking trail because it's almost like a deer trail. The bushes cover it really well, but you can see that there is almost a semi-flattened path. You often see it when you're out hiking and you can see just barely a small path leading through a bunch of bushes where it's not so thick. That's kind of what you see. And that's kind of what I expect to kind of see in the Pacific Northwest setting is while you're running through this urban, I mean, this forests and all that stuff, you also come across paths people have taken quite often and stuff. And it doesn't necessarily feel like it's roadways, but it definitely feels like you can follow these paths and it will eventually take you to a cabin. Maybe someone set up a temporary camping site once or twice. Maybe there's a place people like to go and go dredging, which is like gold mining, looking for flakes inside the stone, a bunch of other things. Uh, it's really interesting the amount of places you can find and sometimes accidentally come across moonshiners. 
Oh, that's a story for me. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that a couple times. You know, it's funny you bring that up because that's one of the reasons why I like the fact that they chose the Olympic Peninsula. A lot of people don't realize this, but in the Olympic Mountains, we have one of the largest rainforests in the United States. And it's such a weird rainforest, too. If you ever get to see it, we don't have mangrove trees, but the water is so prevalent there that the tall trees will grow roots 15 feet up in the air that sprawl out into the ground with swamp-like moss hanging from it. So sure, there are trails, there's old gas stations, there's old hiking, like you said, campsites. But at the same time, because it is a rainforest, nature is able to reclaim those areas rather quickly. So since the exclusion zone has been abandoned for a few years since the last storm event, it's gonna be fun seeing that, I call it like the Jurassic Park experience when you watch The Last World and they're like, where are we? And they kind of clear out the sign and then you see, oh, Jurassic Park site B. It's like, oh my gosh, you're there. I cannot wait for that. When you see a strange alien structure and you wonder, is this alien or is this human? Clear aside the brush and you realize it's just some dude's old fishing shack. And I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and especially with that area being so big into Bigfoot and, and cryptids, it's going to be fun seeing a lot of the posters of like, ah, oh, Sasquatch and all this weird stuff, which clearly we Washingtonians are like, yeah, that's a tourist trap. That's not real. But with the exclusion zones events occurring, it kind of makes you wonder, has this been a problem for a long time and we were in denial? Yeah, you're totally right. Which reminds me, folks, on our merch store, you can buy Bigfoot concrete things to put in your garden. I'm no, just kidding. That's right. <laughs> it's actually modeled after dumps in my feet. We just walk through plaster and send it out. Yeah, because he's out there. He is very, very hairy. Uh, my other favorite thing about it is isolation. I think that's one of the things I like about the long dark. It's not that people just decided not to live here. Something pushed them out, whether it's bad weather or an event, or in this case, a mandatory government uh, evacuation. And a lot of the signage that you see in the trailers and such indicates that it was kind of a forced evacuation. It was, you are no longer allowed to be here. And when you look at a map of the Washington state, and you could Google this online, West Coast Federal Forests, it's crazy how much of the land is federal land. So when they tell you to get out, you have to get out. And for those of you who don't know the Olympic Mountains, who don't know what we're talking about, Forks is actually in the Olympic Peninsula, and that is the town that was featured in the hit book and Twilight series, or hit book and movie series Twilight. Yeah, I'll get it right. I'll get it right. I sparkle. <laughs> You're a vampire. Uh, <laughs> so dump. Is, is isolation something that attracts you in survival games, or is it something that detracts you from survival games? Yeah, I think it actually attracts me to a survival game. Now, don't get me wrong, I like finding visual NPCs who I can trade stuff with, but I also like the fact that when games make it so those NPCs don't stick around or could die. Uh, but isolation itself really gives you a sense of this is it. You are the last stop. There is no one around to help you. Um, now, some games do it well where they have a partner. I can think of Sons of the Forest, for example, where Kevin, or that's his name, right? Am I butchering it? Kevin? It's Kelvin, Dump. Kelvin! Like the temperature. Oh, yeah! It's Kelvin, I totally like didn't know the that. alternative dimension in Star Trek, with an L before the V. Continue. To my point, Under the Forest, he doesn't come and cut you off of your, the camp when you get knocked out the first time. He doesn't pick you back up when you get knocked down and you're about to die. He just lets you die. And that, they did that because Kelvin, unfortunately, had some issues in the crash, so they have a legitimate reason why. But isolation actually gives you that set of fear. It makes you worried about you are the end all. If you don't find enough food, there's no one to rely on. If you don't find enough water, there's no one to fetch it for you. You get stuck, tracked between a saw blade and a bunny rabbit that explodes or something mob on your car. <laughs> well, guess what? You got to figure yourself out of that pickle. Either get cut in half or somehow tame the bunny. That'd be kind of cool if you could tame the bunnies. Um, 
<laughs> have, you, have you seen what they look like? They look like little little koosh balls, and and they stick to your vehicle. And when they get scared, they explode. Oh my gosh, I'm having flashbacks. Oh no, um, no, I'm not, not not bad flashbacks. Uh, the Langoliers. Oh my gosh, you remember those things, World Eaters? Oh my yeah, gosh, no, do they that look like that? Yeah. No, the reason why they're called bunnies is because they do look sentient enough. They hop. Oh, okay. So so, so they do hop kind of like a frog, but they're like glowy, sticky alien balls. So they also stick to your car because they're like, mm, technology. <laughs> um, okay, okay. And it's always funny when you got to leave your car behind to go get water and food and, and you're running out with your crowbar. And then when you come back, you're like, oh, crap, how do I get in my car without causing these things to blow up? Because there, there's one trailer you could watch where it shows the guy run to his car and get in, the bunnies blow up, and it sends his car flying. I'm not talking a roll. Like Hollywood, Independence Day, your car is flying off the road. And then you gotta figure out how to get it from where it lands back up to the road and take it back to the workshop to repair it. So you gotta be careful with that. Can we talk about the car rolling in the air and flying? Uh, I just want to say one thing, my my producer, Yarl might get this. Hey, I found the <clears throat> legacy vehicle system from DayZ, Red. <laughs> you mean <clears throat> the vehicle system where if you run over a takeout cup, your car just <laughs> takes off and goes to the moon? No it's, way. Yeah. <laughs> it's half wheeled vehicle and half space program. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the Kerbal Space Jeep. I remember that game. Uh it, it's really cool looking though, and I, I really enjoy the physics in it because they do make it believable. But you know, you mentioned the car. That's the interesting thing about this. It kind of feels like the car itself is a character in in the game. But there's different biomes you travel through, so you never know what to expect. On one end, you'll be driving through a really calm autumn looking area, enjoying the sunset. Sometimes there's creepy swamps with new bioluminescent mushrooms. And in some cases, you're driving along in the woods to get to a car so you could pull scrap off of it. And there's some weird, I don't know, nano structure that looks like it was built either by aliens or was built by nanites sitting in the middle of the field with Tesla arcs all over it. There's a lot about the game that they've left a mystery, which I, I think is really cool. Um, which brings us to the next point. One of the enemies the radio mentions a lot is the abductors. Who are they? The devs mention them, and in the radio, it mentions that people are taken by the abductors and returned and then distrusted by the government. What's their angle? Who's this faceless entity? And when you look at the cover of the game, it even shows a giant orange beam striking the ground and pulling boulders, like huge boulders up into the air. Who are the abductors? If you could hypothesize that this is pure speculation, what do you think they are? So, uh, they could go two routes on this. I did see the graphics of this, so I don't think they're going to go the cheesy route of Mars Attacks. Although that could be have some humor to it if anybody ever modded that. <laughs> yeah, um, but I could see it actually being very creepy. Um, now, I'm actually a little bit of a fan of alien stuff. I don't believe that aliens did all this crazy stuff, but it is interesting. Some of the more darker side of this stuff, uh, like the so-called aliens that we know who we think are green are more actually considered gray. I don't know what their color really is, but they're actually very, according to most whatever, uh, are very evil very mean, very sinister kind of things. They have needlepoint teeth. They're very ominous. They're almost able to easily sneak behind stuff because they're so skinny and stuff. And mm -hmm. I can almost see the abductors being this gray man theory creepiness level where it's not necessarily they're here to pro uh, probe you or do experiments on you. That no, they're here to take you and you're never coming back. It, yeah. it, it's definitely, it kind of puts chills up your spine thinking about there's something that people have over time already created kind of a lore and history of that actually can be in this game. And I'll tell you what, if I see a little green Martian from Mars Attacks, I'm going to laugh my head off. But if I see 
the gray men act like some of these alien astrologists or whatever they call themselves. I'm not, I can't remember your guys' name. Don't take offense. Um, <laughs> if I, if I see them, if I see them in game based off of what they have described on like discovery or history, or even on some of the YouTube channels I've seen, I will like get chills up my spine and shut down the game. Like, nope. <laughs> because they I are agree. I think the other thing, I think the angle they're going to go for is that you never see them. The storm that you're running away from is actually their giant beam that is sucking everything up. And like I said, there's five biomes with your warehouse stuck in the middle. So it's not just a, oh, the storm's come, we can't go back there. There's a certain, I guess, a radioactive period, but you can return back to biomes after a storm has passed. But... From the color of the beam and the logo, from seeing how terrible it is when you're trying to race away from it, it really does seem like uh, something that maybe not so we're here to kill you as much as it's a mining beam. I almost feel like, especially in the Olympic Mountains, what if they're here taking samples and they're just like, "Ooh, look at all this plant life, you know, and that we're just a tiny little insignificant animal. Which is interesting because when you play the game, if you do have to hunt animals for food, you're no you're treating the squirrels and the rabbits no differently than these abductors are treating you, which is kind of a a parallel. Who is it for us to say that that's not fair and it's wrong when we're scooping up animals and eating them? <laughs> that is interesting. You mentioned that it's like slightly irradiated, so you can't go back and stuff. I wonder if that plays into maybe the theory that you're saying they're testing stuff. I wonder if yeah. uh, maybe it's a big test tube for them. Maybe it's the That's government. You know, because the government be seems that's why they pushed everyone out so quick. Right. Like maybe this is a mistake and they're like, uh, oops. <laughs> but By the way, back to the other we'll character. Talk about okay. We are We're still talking about Pacific, Pacific Drive. <laughs> if it was Pacific, <laughs> can you imagine that? You're like, well, you have to build your own car, and eventually you get your own mech so that you can go toe to toe with the abductors, like guide you. <laughs> but that's the interesting thing. The dev talked about the car, and you know, whenever you do the Pacific Drive, it's never in a really nice car. It's always in that car that you souped up for long travel. And one of the things that they talked about is they want the car to feel like your only friend, like your companion. And we've played games like that, where your uh, Star Wars does it a lot, where your companion is a droid that you cannot understand, that is an artificial intelligence, so does it have feelings or not? But either way, we still kind of treat it that way. And one of the things I was talking with the people in the forums about, because they're like, I don't really see how they're going to be able to create this emotional attachment with the car. When I was working at Best Buy, we had people bringing in their Roombas that sucked in dog poop. They would not buy a new Roomba. They named their Roomba. Like they got attached to their Roomba. So I absolutely can imagine getting attached to this. And although those of you who are listening to podcasts might not be able to see this, but in the picture we have here, you're arriving with a gas tank to a station wagon that is literally stripped down to almost the frame that you have to fix up in this garage to drive around, which I think is really cool. Um, uh, the car, the car's a tool. You can upgrade it. In the end, it ends up looking like the Ecto-1 from Ghostbusters. It's so cool, all the different things you can get. And it doesn't look like, oh, well, we men and blacked it. We, we went and got like 22nd century level technology. No, this really does look like a redneck was sitting there going, you know what? I got this spotlight that has a motion sensor on it that'll track anything coming up to you. It's such a good idea that they've had this real advanced technology, but homemade look. Yes, Dom? I know what's wrong with it. Ain't I got no gas in it? <laughs> That's for you, puppy. That's for you. Uh, so w the thing that I want in a game is a little bit more realistic on the mechanics and upgrades. If we're going to have to fix this thing, if we're going to get emotionally attached to this car, I, I don't want it just to be like a... Oh, I want to upgrade to a level four spoiler. Kind of like in Ghostbusters when you upgrade your photon pack. That's cool and all, but I really want to actually do the repair. What are your thoughts on it? Uh, yeah, I, I remember showing me a video about this, and the guy really said he wants to give people the impression that they're actually being a mechanic. 
Obviously not into such detail as cursing it out because a bolt won't bust loose or whatever, but to the level where you actually feel yourself accomplishing the exchange of parts and you can see visibly the car being upgraded and stuff because you're getting kind of nitty gritty with it. Um, and I actually can see that being playing out really well because at the end of the video you showed me, there was a bunch of different configurations they were showing, you know, every like uh, half a second, da -da 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 -da, you know, one after another. And it was really cool to see all of the possibilities as well as them actually showing casing, kind of replacing the parts. Oh, yeah. Replacing is a big one, because if your car takes damage, you have to replace the part. Um, it's not like you can you can just hammer it out unless it's the core panels. But more to your point that you had mentioned earlier, multiple ways to solve problems. I see us looking at the next biome in the exclusion zone, like the, the slime biome, I call it. It's very swampy, very like bioluminescent, green, radioactive goo popping from the enemies. And one of the things that I thought about was, dang, you might actually have to pre-plan upgrading your car before you go there. You may have to go back to the shop and find out what parts you need and then head back to a zone you've previously been in where you remember seeing those parts and then bring them back to the garage and build. And that's such a cool idea. Um, I think that'll add a lot of longevity to the game, even though there's not a whole lot to it from, you know, just looking at it from the surface. But I think it gives you that way of problem solving. It's like, okay, in order to get out, I need this core component. But in order to get this core component, I need to at least build this component so I can go into this biome to gather the resources. And uh, it also is very roguelike. So if you make the wrong decision and you go out there and your car breaks down, you can either start over or even, you know, have to try to troubleshoot on the scene. So my question to you is, would this make an intriguing survival game to you? And what survival elements do you see in this game or you would like to see this in this game that you think would make it a ton of fun? Well, you've mentioned about the intruders. You've talked about these fuzzy bunny things that blow up and buzz saws. Um, now, I know and I hope that there's a lot more environmental threats, like accidentally going to a tree, rolling down a hill, blowing your tires, that kind of stuff. Things that punish you for poor maintenance on your vehicle. Because I don't want to see a game like this where they say your car is a tool, then you develop a friendship with it, and then you can drive on your tires for 500 uh, miles and never have to worry about blowing them, uh, driving over a sharp rock or whatever. Um, because wear and tear on a vehicle is very extreme in a lot of these situations. Even in real life, people don't realize how much wear and tear goes on to a vehicle, how much it actually costs to keep it upkept if you are a off-roading fanatic. Which, I'm assuming in this game, you're going to do a lot of off-roading. So, axles, having a wheel, a wheel alignment, tire wear, even... Uh, making sure you don't constantly bottom out and destroy your oil pans and stuff are all very important things. So, for me, this has to have those elements where it's enough quality of life fun while still engaging in the maintenance of the vehicle. Right, and one of the things they pointed out, in fact, on the forums, they were making a joke about Washington State's condition of its roads. They said going off-road is going to be a problem. You'll have to upgrade your ride height as well as your tires. In fact, you can eventually upgrade your tires with some futuristic tech to give them a little more speed and durability. But oh, they also minute. mentioned... Mm -hmm. Did you just say futuristic tech? So this is you not 100% can... 20, 20th century stuff? This is actually... No. You might be able to get mm -hmm. cool stuff? You start off, like, getting uh, stuff from cars, like better tires. They did mention potholes can put you out of business. You know, because uh, they were making comments about the road conditions. But the idea is when you see these alien structures, you could whip out your crowbar or whatever weapon you have at the time, run from your car and try to salvage stuff from it. But it's also kind of like a puzzle solver. How do you turn it off? What do you salvage? What are you looking for? And you learn about the alien technology the more you salvage it which is why people go into the exclusion zone in the first place. And there are some really cool things you can get for your car, like little 
static shields to keep things away. E uh, you could build a Faraday cage around it so that during the lightning storms and stuff, it doesn't short out your systems. I mean, it's really, really neat what they're doing. But more importantly, I was trying to look up crafting. You're not just building your car. You start off with a crowbar. And when you go out and you see some of these structures, you're like, mm, this crowbar ain't going to cut it. I'm going to need something better. And uh, for those who are listening and not watching, we actually have a screenshot up here of the game where they built a giant grinder tool out of spare parts. And my favorite thing about this is it's got a vice grip holding everything together. Like, I, I love this red green style problem solving. Uh, but I would imagine even those tools use fuel. So you got to you got to play it smart. You're not just upgrading your vehicle as much as you are the gear that you carry around. No, that, that's totally right. That's totally right. Also, devs, if you ever listen to this, can we have a nod or an Easter egg of an orange crowbar key? <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> Because there's aliens, there's a crowbar, you know there's what I'm thinking, yep. folks. <laughs> and if there's a guy who comes up to you and goes, I didn't mean to insinuate you were sleeping on the job, I will poop my pants and be over the moon. Now, one thing I really hope for is I know there's not any contact with humans, but it would be interesting to get radio chatter of maybe other people who are out there who get totally iced by the storm. And then if you know their general proximity with your radio, maybe you can go look for their remains and take their stuff. That would be cool, too. Yeah, I agree. And you know what would be also really cool is maybe um, maybe these wrecks, or the wrecks that look a little bit more clean, a little bit more refreshed, could have deceased people in it. Or maybe some of the older ones. And maybe there's some sort of, uh, you know, recorded software in there or whatever. Because it's kind of, I believe, uh, well, this is my own head. I don't have any actual proof of this. But I imagine most people in their final moments want to leave something behind in case they're ever found. And it'd be interesting. It'd be kind of like a cool way to introduce some lore. Maybe give the adductors something a little bit creepy about them. Like, you know, kind of like a... And maybe a little bit of humor, too. But, you know, just imagine you find this recording on this corpse. It'd been decayed a little bit. The animals had gnawed on it a bit. And it's all like, okay, has, I don't know what's happening. The beam's coming to get me. And they're still there, but they're dead. Which would be interesting because maybe the beam doesn't Ooh. take everything. I know they talked about a lot of mystery being in the game and a lot of lore you find from radio broadcasts and things left behind from campers and such. <laughs> How cool would it be to have that Blair Witch situation where it's like, I'm hiding behind this trunk. I don't think it saw me. And then maybe you hear what the adductors sound like in the background, which just gets your brain going because I'm telling you, Dump, I know that they've only released a little bit of footage from it, but the nights get dark because it's in the Olympic Peninsula. The canopy overlaps, so you don't always have a view of the sky. Sometimes when you look around, everything looks the same. In fact, a lot of the upgrades you can get on the car are huge lighting systems that light up the sides of the road and stuff to help you salvage. So it's going to be real creepy if you're out there and you find a camp with a recording, nobody, you listen to it and you're like, oh, and then you look back at your car and it's just sitting there and you're like, <laughs> that would be so great to have to run oh, back man. to your car out of fear. Oh, well, not, I'm really looking forward don't to know it. it. But nights, okay, so people go in survival games, oh, uh, nighttime around my home is so bright. Well, honestly, folks, it's like light pollution. And mm -hmm. light pollution does fade away. That's why when you go out in the woods and you can see the stars so bright and you're just all like, ah, ah, it, it's really because there's no light pollution there. And campfires don't give off don't give off the same light pollution that our fluorescent LEDs and other lights right. do. Uh, think of a noise filter on your video game. Where, you know, the image gets really noisy. There's a lot of white specks. That's a version of, uh, you know, uh, light noise. Um, or uh, light, no whatever. Light radiation is what it's really called. But yeah, so when you're out there in the Pacific North Olympic Peninsula, even now, it gets pitch black in between, you know, truck stops and all that kind of stuff. 
and your headlights really matter nowadays. Can you imagine a couple of years to not maybe a decade of nobody being there? It'd be just you know, it's funny. It's funny you bring that up, too, because if you look at some old paintings from the medieval ages and even in Vincent van Gogh's day, people in those eras used to be able to look up and see the galaxy perfectly. And one of the reasons why I was so excited about Daisy 1.21 is how they handled like campfire light and how the how the headlamps fall off. Because like you said, the atmosphere is full of nitrogen gas and water vapor. And even though you don't see a fog, there is a fog in our atmosphere. So come to a certain point, campfires and flashlights have a hard time penetrating all of that stuff that's in our atmosphere and don't go very far. But the frequency of fluorescent lights shoot out really far. And one of the reasons why the Olympic Mountains is my favorite place to camp is even though Seattle is just right across the sound, there is no light pollution. And when you're camping in your tent, you have to pee and your campfire is out. You open the door. If you do not have a lantern, you can't see anything. And honestly, I don't take a lantern when I go out to pee because that's even worse. When you're holding a lantern, and you step out of your tent in the Olympic Peninsula. You can't see anything beyond the light of the lantern. It only it lights up around you, but you can't see what's in the dark. So I just I just pee in the dark. Well, bless you, because I don't know about you, lantern or not. I don't know where I'd be. <laughs> <laughs> you just have bottles in your tent. You're like, well, I guess one less water bottle won't hurt. <laughs> I just aim and hope. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the, are you one of those where you just unzip the tent and you're like, ah, it'll dry up by morning. <laughs> I, I aim for my buddy's campfire. <laughs> That's <laughs> terrible, guys, folks. Don't you, do it. It if, smells terrible. If you actually are camping, by the way, you can get a little portable urinal that'll go through the window of your tent. If your tent has zip windows, that way you or your lady friends don't have to leave uh, the tent. So fun fact. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and hear from our reporter on the scene who's in the Olympic Peninsula right now. <laughs> Uh, Dave, do you read? I, I know you're in the Olympic exclusion zone. Are you, are you there? Oh, hang on, let me change the frequency. Let, ah, he's coming through. Okay, Dave, yes, we hear you. How is it over there? Are, are you able to avoid the storms? Sounds like he's doing fine. Dave, Dave, were you able to acquire a car? And if so, what model was it? I, I didn't catch that dumb. What model of car did he say he had? Uh, he said he's infected, so he can't drive. So you're just shambling through the exclusion zone. What if you get abducted? Well, if he gets abducted, dump, at least we have Earl as backup. Whoa. Uh, this just in, if Dave does make it back, uh, I probably will no longer be working here. I thought so. Dave Thank Bigfoot. you. Bigfoot's going to smash Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. And don't get smashed by Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wait. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. In a more to be a serious note, folks, we hit a hundred subs within the past week. And we are so happy to finally hit that milestone. But you know what, folks? Always look forward and keep your feet going. We're going to be going to our next milestone, which is 250 subs. That's right. It's 150 more subs than last time. But we want to make that mark. Our goal is to possibly be able to um, submit to the YouTube Partner Program within the first six months of this, and we are so happy you guys are joining in this. Remember, folks, don't tell people to watch us unless you actually think we are doing good content. But we're happy to have you here. And we want to give you a huge shout out. Oh, Red. Oh, Red. So go ahead and give your shout out, and then I'm going to jump in um, and grab the steering wheel and steer us over two ditches and into the field next to it. Excellent. I just wanted to give a huge shout out to the community and how much we appreciate everything you've done to support us. Uh, honestly, nine, nine weeks in, 
and we've already hit 100. It feels great. And I just love the interactions that we've been having with you guys. So thank you so much because you guys make this worth it. And that's all I got. How about you, Red? So you made mention uh, earlier in the show about Star Trek. And so I have a Star Trek question for you. Um, yes. We just started watching Star Trek Discovery. Um, my question is related to the Klingons and what the talk decided to make them reptilian speak Klingon like orcs and have the honor of a Romulan. So that is something that it, once you watch through Discovery, if you start watching Strange Worlds, they kind of touch up on. But with how many times Star Trek they've gone into the past, every time they do it, it delays the timeline and bends it every so often. So in Discovery's timeline, they've bent it to where the war with the Federation and the Klingons was different. The Klingons had to populate different worlds. And those particular Klingons you see are actually from a specific world that has changed them on an evolutionary scale. Except that isn't that supposed to be the prime timeline and not the Kelvin timeline that you referenced? So no, Discovery is actually not part of the Kelvin or the prime, which you'll learn later. It's a ripple effect because of Jonathan Archer. That's oh boy. Gallywag. I don't know why every time they make a new iteration of Star Trek, the special effects production team decides we need to change the transporter and we need to change the Klingons. Well, I, I, I will tell you this. When you watch Strange New Worlds after you're done with Discovery, they revert it for the better. Okay, good to know. Good to know. Yeah, I just had to ultimately set it aside and say, these aren't really Klingons. These are orcs, and they're speaking yeah, the black speech. these are Yurikai. <laughs> they, they, don't even, they don't even speak Klingon well. They stumble Ta-ta, over the words. Hobbits. <laughs> <laughs> but oh. <laughs> so that was my that was my interruption and steer us completely outside of our scope just for a little fun. We were talking about and, aliens anyway, so that works. I'm not saying so, it was aliens, but <laughs> it was aliens. It was aliens. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope that guy has a meme poster in Pacific Drive. That would be so funny to see that on a wall. <laughs> But guys, just so you know, uh, in this episode, we did talk about Pacific Drive. There's a lot of unknowns, but with a little bit of digging, you could find more and more about the game. Uh, one of the things that rubbed us the wrong way was it seemed like you were in the car most of the time, but it actually seems like, according to screenshots from Ironwood Studios and several of their posts on the forums, that a lot of the times you're on foot. And in fact, that fear of what will happen to your car when you leave it behind, that's part of the game. So it is going to be... A lot more expansive than I thought, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. We'd love to hear your thoughts. We know it was a holiday season, but if you end up catching this video after it was live, definitely leave us some comments below because uh, there are a lot of new games coming out in 2023 and 2024, and they are amazing looking. So can't wait to hear your feedback. Dump, what are we doing next week? Next week, folks, we're going to be talking more about DayZ. And it's going to be a server owner episode and what they go through and what they have to do to keep the community servers running. But I'll hope to see you folks next week. All right. From all of us to you guys, take care, survivors, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Well, folks, thank you very much for watching our video and this podcast episode. Please like and subscribe, and it definitely helps us when you do. Please remember that you can also comment down below, and who knows, maybe we'll read or talk about your comment in our next episodes. Folks, I also want you to make sure to thank our staff members, being Yarla Goats and Red Falcon. Yarla Goats streams on Twitch quite regularly, and Red Falcon is responsible for the Red Falcon hel heli mods on the Daisy Workshop on PC. We are happy to have you folks here, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. 